Good day, everyone. Welcome to our lecture on Plato's Allegory of the Cave from Book 7 of the Republic. So for our outline today, we'll first discuss the Republic as a text, and then we have a note on the Socratic method, the discussion of the dialectic, and finally the Allegory of the Cave. And then we'll look at the qualities of the philosophers and ultimately the task of philosophy. So let's go into the discussion of the Republic as a text. So the Republic of Plato was written in Greek at around 375 BC. It is one of the first treatises about how to run the city-state. It can be considered as a philosophic, literary, even historical text. Written in the form of dialogues where the usual mode of philosophizing was a traditional question and answer method aimed at the clarification of concepts. The text talked about justice, the just man, and the nature of the just city-state. So the book is intended to provide a political model of, of how society should be organized along rational and ethical lines. It is considered as the first book on political science. This concern was answered by looking back into the nature of the individual whose structure would serve as an analog of how society should work. A very important insight here would be is that socio-political theory is determined by the concept of man utilized within a given system. Let's go into the Socratic method. So the Socratic method is a traditional question and answer, answer dialectic where the mind is led to understand the truth about a particular proposition from a state of ignorance. It is also called asmaiotics or method of elenchus, from the Greek elenchos, examining in order to refute. This implies the idea of drawing out ideas and their underlying presuppositions through the question and answer process as a kind of intellectual midwifery. Here, one progresses from a consideration of the many positions about a given proposition and proceeds to examine whether they hold true or not, or whether they stand the test of rational critique. The Socratic method is the movement of thought exemplified in Plato's many dialogues, precisely indicated the multifarious character of the dialectic. Socrates usually starts from a position of ignorance and proceeds to examine the many assumed truths about a given proposition. He then proceeds to debunk each of them until he arrives at his own point, usually one that builds upon the earlier propositions, but one which is no longer subject to rebuttal since it becomes so obvious to the mind that it is no longer possible to deny it. The Aporia so here, the opponent is led into an aporia, or impasse, a stumbling block, or position of undecidability, such as the mind can no longer proceed in accordance with its fundamental theoretical commitments, but instead is forced to recognize the contradiction and hence limitations of one's intellectual position. The aporia is arrived at after the removal of those beliefs or opinions which cannot stand the test of critique. Often, it is the opponent himself who recognizes the limits and contradictions of their own position. So here are the steps in the Socratic method. First is that Socrates' opponents give a thesis a claim. This thesis is the subject of examination, which is called the elenchus. Second, Socrates gives an initial agreement with the thesis to clarify it. And third, Socrates then examines the elements of the thesis by asking its definition. If these definitions fall into a problematic, Socrates points them out and shows the inadequacy of the position or claim. Fourth, through question and answer, however, it is his opponents who recognize the limitations of their own position or claim. The original thesis is either contradictory or cannot be defended completely. 
By delving into the contradictions of the thesis or claim, the opponent's thesis is often shown to be false or at least lacking adequate justification. The opposite of the thesis is shown to be the true one. So let's go into a note on the dialect. In Book 7 of the Republic, Socrates explains that dialectics is the way, the movement of thought which enables us to reach the highest knowledge at which all other sciences achieve, using only reason and without the help of any of the senses. Dialectics is the way to discover the absolute without the assistance of the senses and perseveres until by pure intelligence, he arrives at the perception of the absolute good. Dialectics is the only one who can go to the first principles. It can achieve this by looking for the point of communion of the different sciences where they can be considered in their mutual affinities. The different sciences must have some other term for them because for Plato, their nature is that they have greater clearness than opinion, but less clearness than science. Science for Plato is considered only as dialectics. Dialectic alone goes directly to the first principles and is the only science which does away with hypothesis in order to make her ground secure. Dialectics is the coping stone of the sciences and is set over them. No science is higher. So only the dialectician is able to attain a conception or insight into essences. For this reason, they must possess several characteristics if they are to be trained as guardians. So here we come to the allegory of the cave. In Book 7 of the Republic, Plato set out to describe the analogy of how knowledge of the real can be attained by going beyond the reality of what we can see. For Plato, what is true is to be found in the world of ideas as opposed to the things in the world of the senses which he considers only to be mere copies of ideas that we find in the world of ideas. For Plato, what is really true are the ideas in the ideal world. They are absolute and changing eternal realities that serve as the models for the changeable things that we find in the sensible world. In the allegory, Plato likens people untutored in the theory of forms to prisoners chained in a cave unable to turn their heads. All they can see is the wall of the cave. Behind them burns a fire. Between the fire and the prisoners, there is a parapet along which puppeteers can walk. The puppeteers who are behind the prisoners hold the puppets that cast shadows in the wall of the cave. The prisoners are unable to see these puppets, the real objects that pass behind them. What the prisoners see and hear are shadows and echoes cast by objects that they do not see. So in order to better understand Plato's theory of knowledge, it is important to note here that he assigns to human reason the highest capacity to know what is true, as opposed to understanding, faith, and perception. For him, reason is the highest faculty that enables us to contemplate knowledge and being through the dialectics. Understanding is lower because it's only concerned with the lower kind of science, and faith ultimately is non-rational, while perception of the shadows would correspond to the lowest form of knowledge that is coming from the senses. So here, the prisoners represent the people in the world who only see the physical things. For them, truth is nothing other than the shadows of artificial things. In the allegory of the cave, the prisoners mistake the shadow for reality. Truth for them is the shadows. They have been so used to the shadows that even if they see real people and things, they would not believe them to be true. The light of the sun will glare them and hurt their eyes, rendering them blind to the truth of reality. They will not be able to differentiate truth from illusion. So in Plato, true knowledge is that which draws you nearer to being. It is the task of the dialectic to bring man into the light of understanding real existence of things and to eventually contemplate his own proper place in the world and as he is. There is thus in Plato the positing of a world of forms beyond what we see, 
as the world of the senses. So it is important to note here the idea of the ascent of the soul or what we may also call as the journey towards the truth. For Plato, the soul must journey to the world of forms and along this ascent, the last thing to be known is the idea of the good. That is the cause of all that is right and fair in everything in the visible. It gave birth to light and the sovereign in the intelligible, it's of sovereign, it provided truth and intelligence. So the good is the universal author of all things beautiful and right, parent of light and lord of light in the visible world, and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual. It is only in accordance with this good that the individual can have the power to act rationally in his private and public life. So in the context of this ascent, we can say that the man who escaped the cave and saw the light represents the philosopher who is able to see the truth. And having seen the good, he is the only one who can act prudently, both in private and public. This is an allusion to the person who will lead the city-state. The philosopher's task is therefore clear. To accompany others into the journey towards the truth. But this is a difficult task. If he goes back to the cave and tells the prisoners about what is really true, would anyone really believe him? Often these people who have seen the truth do not want to deal with the prisoners. They do not want to come back to the cave. They prefer contemplating the forms. Those who have attained the beatific vision no longer want to go down to the mundane level of the material. They already naturally desire to dwell in the upper world. This is the reason why the philosopher is often misunderstood as being ridiculously irrelevant to evil affairs. This makes clear to us Plato's ultimate concern about man's ethical life, that is the care for the soul. Ascent to the forms, that is, to the truth and the idea of the good, is difficult. But it is also burdensome to guide and argue with people who are stubborn and opinionated about what is really true. The philosopher is therefore in a dilemma. To continue contemplating the forms or to come back to the world of the senses and deal with the unruly natures. Those people who have knowledge of the good are the only ones who are able to found and run the business of the state. The best minds or philosophers must be the ones to lead the citizens towards knowledge of the good. To do this, they have to return to the concrete material world where they have to secure the happiness of the whole state and not only of a particular class, to hold together everyone by persuasion and necessity to support the state and therefore for everyone. Since we cannot leave the state to the uneducated, the rightful ruler of the polis should be the philosopher king, one who is able to know the good and act so as to achieve what is the good for, for the polis. This ruler must be selected from a group of wise people whom Plato calls as the guardians. But who can be philosophers? Only the dialectician is able to attain a conception or insight into essences. For this reason, they must possess several characteristics if they are to be trained as guardians. So the state must choose those who are first, surest, or steadiest, the bravest, the fairest, and the handsomest. Those with noble and generous tempers, generous and virile or robust character. We also have to choose those with natural gifts that make it easier for them to learn or be educated, those who are eager, and those who have the keenness and ready powers of acquisition, for the mind easily faints with mental activity than with the physical. And lastly, those with good memory. But there is a problem with the present. According to Socrates, 
Those who study philosophy have no vocation. This is why she has fallen into disrepute. Her two sons should take her by the hand and not the bastards. In Plato's thinking, therefore, we see that philosophy has a task, and that is to build a working ethical society that can only be possible if we know how justice works in the individual. Hence the question, what is justice given in the Republic? How justice works in the individual can be seen in the figure of the just man. The just man is one in whom the individual, in whom the different parts of the soul are in harmony. He is the opposite of the unjust man who merely indulges in all his desires. The just man is one in whom the lower appetites are subordinated to the control of reason. So justice is finally defined in this context. A just soul is a soul that pursues the right desires. This will determine the health and the kind of soul one has. One must therefore guard oneself against the lower desires, such as physical or sexual pleasures. And in this context, justice amounts to the health of the soul. A just soul is a soul with its parts arranged appropriately and is thus a healthy soul. An unjust soul, by contrast, is an unhealthy soul. So by analogy, we can see that the different parts of the soul are represented by the different parts of the individual. So the rational part would correspond to the head, the spirited part would correspond to the heart, and the appetitive part would correspond to the lower faculties of the senses. So there are different virtues that correspond to each part of the soul. So wisdom and truth for the rational part, honor, love and courage for the spirited part, and the lower appetitive faculties are the ones that actually pursue desires such as food, drink, sex, and money. So if we will look at these different parts of the soul, Plato would give us the very structure of how an ideal society should be, where you have the philosopher king chosen among the guardians as the one to rule the society. So guardians should possess the virtues of being spirited, honor-loving, philosophical or knowledge-loving, and they should also be physically strong and fast. Next would be the auxiliaries who would correspond to the spirited part of the soul. And lastly, the workers and producers who actually make up the appetitive part of the society. The important thing that we have to take into account here is about the principle of specialization, which states that all do the job to which they are best suited. It is important to note here that Plato would advocate removing some members of the society, those who are chronically ill, physically and mentally, must either be left to die or be actively put to death. So to conclude this lecture, we can therefore say that the philosophic life is intimately connected to the task of building, achieving, or creating justice both in the soul of the individual and in the society. And this is why philosophy is essentially political. So that ends our lecture and hope to see you in the next one. Good day.